Good afternoon um, to another lecture in the series Basics of Macromolecular Crystallography. Today I am going to talk about refinement, which is um, the step after phasing. So just to wrap up a little bit how far we've come up until now. You measure your crystal, usually with x-rays. You get diffraction, which gives you spots on a detector. These spots are then integrated and scaled. Then, because these only represent the amplitudes of the Fourier transform, you have to phase your structure, meaning you have to estimate or guess the correct phases using, using either molecular replacement or experimental phasing. And then once you have initial phases, which can still be rough estimates, you can calculate a map. And in that map, you can build your initial model. Today, um, this step of building an initial model, unless you have done molecular replacement, in which case you start from the replacement model, is often done automatically. So refinement will typically start with um, some kind of backbone or partial structure, but not always so. So let's give it a go. Um, this is a picture of restraints from Postmart about which I'm going to talk in the very end of this talk as an example of an advanced topic in low resolution refinement. However, here you can see how every atom is um, in its movement restrained by the other atoms with the gray lines representing how the atoms are connected to each other. First, we start with some basic concepts. Um, I am going to talk about least squares here. Least squares is not the foremost method to refine macromolecular structures, but it can be viewed as a special case of maximum likelihood, which is the most common method these days. And because it's very worthwhile in, from an educational perspective to talk about least squares first, I'm going to introduce concepts using this. And the reason I'm doing this is because all the concepts can be shown trying to fit a line to measurement points. So now I know this is not how your uh, reflection data look, but let's just look at this as theory for the moment and dive into it a little bit. Um, Imagine you have measured data points. You know they have been produced from a line that you've measured. And all these measurement data points have uncertainties. The standard deviation attached to it represented here by this bar. You have the x-axis on the horizontal and the y-axis um, on the vertical. Now, you would like to fit a line. A line can be described as uh, m y equals m times x plus b um, with m giving how much the line um, increases its slope, m is the slope, and b is the um, starting point, in this case uh, 0 0.1. If you are adjusting m and b, you can adjust the line. So, for example, a negative slope would give you a line that goes downwards. So M and B are your model's parameters, and the line is your model. So you've decided whatever you've measured, it will be line formed, and therefore um, a line is a good model to use. Now, which one is true? Is this one better than the first, or perhaps even that one? That is a very tough decision to make. However, Already many, many decades, centuries ago, actually, someone has solved the problem of how can we find, given measurement points and uncertainties, the best line. And how do we do this? Well, we use least squares. In least squares, you draw a line from your measurement point onto the model, the line that you want to evaluate, represented here as these red shapes. You do this for every measurement point going to touch the line that you are wanting to evaluate. You then square those distances. That would give you these yellow squares. You then sum up all of these yellow squares, which gives you a total area. The line for which 
the squares give you the smallest area for which you have the least squares is the best solution to the problem, assuming that your standard uncertainties are Gaussian distributed. So you, we are searching for the blue line in which the sum of all these squares is minimal, the method of least squares invented by Gauss. The best solution has the smallest squared sum. And actually, in this case, it would look like this. Of course, from this least squares method, you would also have an m and a b value. And if you know your two parameters, m and b, you could draw that line, say, in Excel or any other program you want. You just need to know the model and the parameters. Now, data to parameter ratio is very important. If you look at this, if you only would have two crosses, two measurement points, you could still fit a line, but it is evident that you would be a lot more uncertain. So the more data you have, the better can you determine your parameters. The fewer parameters you have, also the better can you determine your parameters. At least you need as many parameters as you have measurements. Otherwise, you cannot have a unique solution. So more data, less parameters is important. This goes for generally squares, but it's also true for X-ray crystallography in which we want to measure as many reflections as possible and have a model with as few parameters as possible in order to get um, some certainty into those parameters. So imagine that we have some additional measurement points immediately it becomes clearer that actually our least squares fit must be a little bit lower. Um, the error of the measurements is playing less of a role if you've made more measurements. More measurements are better. Now, there are two other things that you can do. One are you introduce restraints. So you are fitting your model to measured data, but in the case of a crystallography model, you also know a few dependencies that have not exactly to be fulfilled, but will be true most of the time. For example, you could say that if six atoms are forming an aromatic phenyl ring, they always need to be on the same plane, and hence you are restraining the movement orthogonal to the plane that things are that atoms are allowed, and you give a penalty if atoms are moving off the plane of the aromatic ring. Um, so you need to know some kind of target value. You need to know some condition you want to fulfill. Restraints are treated like data. So depending on how certain you are, they have to be fulfilled. You can give them a standard uncertainty. And they generally increase the number of data you have. Constraints are values or dependencies which have to be fulfilled exactly, meaning you get less independent parameters. So look again at this example. Here, red would, restrain, would represent restraints. So you can see that all of the restraints have an uncertainty as well, and they are technically treated as additional data points. And again, they improve um, your model. Constraints are fixing one of your parameters to a value that you know. For example, here B has to be zero. So there is no starting uh, value. The function, the model we are fitting is then Y equals M times X plus zero, which can be omitted. So you've reduced the number of parameters you are determining from two to one. And of course, I don't know, we have here perhaps 15 measurement point and restraints. If you have only to determine one parameter with 15 data points, it's a much better determination than having two parameters that need to be fitted to 15 data points. However, a constraint assumption has to be absolutely certain because if this is wrong, you would never recover from it. 
So if, for example, this function doesn't necessarily go through zero and you haven't refined this parameter, you've just set it to a fixed value, the model is going to be wrong because you just had a wrong underlying assumption for your model. So what does this mean for crystallography? How well does the structure fit the data? Um, the data you have actually are intensities. You've measured intensities after integration. But we are usually looking at data in macromolecular crystallography as structure factor amplitudes, which if you remember the structure factor amplitude square is proportional to the intensity. So the data are structure factor amplitudes, your measurement data. The function is the structural model, the atomic model, ball and sticks. Um, the structure factor amplitudes, F calc, are calculated from the model. So we are calculating if we would do an X-ray diffraction of this crystal with the space group and this model in it, what structure factor amplitudes, what intensities do we expect? And these can then be compared to the FOPS values that we have measured. So you calculate what measurement values you expect given this model and you compare them to the actual measured data and you try to make them fit as well as possible to each other. And you do this by adjusting the parameters of the model in order to maximize the fit between the model and the data. In order to know how well our model is fitting the data, we have the crystallographic R value. This is a very nice thing. It would be even nicer if it would be a correlation coefficient for the statistics nerds out there, but it is what it is. This is historically what we use. So R, um, which is, the, by the way, it's the crystallographic R value, nothing to do with the corona R value. The R value is the difference between the observed structure factor amplitudes minus the calculated ones from the model divided by the sum of all of the observed ones and times 100 so you get a percentage. So it's essentially the difference between the observed data and the data that you would expect given your model. So how would, well your model and the X-ray data agree? For small molecule structures, our values are typically in the range of between one and 10% is acceptable. For macromolecular structures, values range from about 10 to 35%. So they are much higher, which points us at um, a main research topic of my lab, which is the question, why is the fit of macromolecular data so bad? Um, have we some problem in data processing? Uh, are we having a lot of errors in our measured data or have we missed something underlying all 170,000 structures in our model? Is there something that we are not modeling that we should be aware of that we just aren't? Um, however, for you, it's only important to know that about 20% is a normal R value for a macromolecule and that they are generally higher than for small molecule structures. And also very, very, very important for refinement is the free R value. The free R value is calculated using FOPS values that are left out in refinement. So the model is not optimized to the FOPS values, typically about 5% of reflections are sorted out. They should be, I would say, a minimum, absolute minimum is about 400 reflections. If you've got very few reflections in your data set from a peptide, for example, you want to consider increasing the percentage, it should be about 5% otherwise. And these are then calculated in the same way. There's an R value calculated, but as these reflections have never been used in refinement, it kind of gives you a somewhat independent criterion. So, if your normal R value calculated with what you have used to fit your model is low, but your R3 is relatively high, that means that you have overfitted your data. You have too many parameters 
and actually what you've done has no relevance uh, to the measurement. So the, the hypothesis, your model is looking nice at first glance, but possibly is not true given the measured data. Um, here's another example. Um, so what we would want, but we can't have is a perfect map. Uh, sorry, is a perfect map. Um, that would be an R value of zero. If we calculate the map with a model, remember the phases come from the model. I'm going to have another slide about this later. If we calculate the map with a model that is not perfectly fitting the data, this is 20.4%, you get artifacts. So as you can see here, the backbone density is not consecutive. There are some gaps here. Uh, this two points are merged, so it's not great. What is refined? We are refining atomic coordinates. This gives us three parameters per atom, X, Y, and Z. You can find them in a PDB file, for example, or in a ZIP file. Then atomic displacement. This is because the atom is no point scatterer, given that we are averaging over millions of unit cells and over time, the atoms have some displacement from each other. And this is described as a Gaussian, either a isotropic Gaussian, which is the same in all directions. In that case, it's one parameter, or as an ellipsoid, in which case it's six per atom, um, because you also need to orient your system. So you have got three in each direction, and then you need a three coordinate system in order to orient the ellipsoid. Um, alternatively to this so-called anisotropic refinement, you can also do TLS, where you separate the protein into different domains, and each one of them is allowed anisotropic movement, but as a whole. This gives you 20 parameters per domain. Then you may have three variables. For example, for disorder occupancy, they're variable, if any, not all programs allow you to have them. The origin position is one refinement parameter per axis. The solvent model is two parameters for everything. So this is a quick note here. We are describing this, this order solvent, which makes 46% an average of your, un, of your unit cell with only two parameters. So this is a very clear shortcoming, I think, of our refinements. But so far, we haven't found a better solvent model than the one that uses these two parameters, or at least nothing that qualified very, very clearly in all cases as a better model. And then you have a scale factor, which is the scale factor between FOPS and FCALC, because clearly you've measured FOPS and then FCALC is calculated, but on what scale generally should it be to the FOPS values? So why do we need restraints? Imagine these are two atoms. One, this one, is having a B factor of 20. This one is having a larger B factor, so you can see that the bell curve is larger. They're both isotropic um, with, say, B factor 50. They are 1.3 angstroms apart. Angstroms are down here on this axis. Now, while the individual form factors may be looking like nice, even at like this, resolution, the sum of the two of them looks like this. And it's very hard to see the maximum here. Yeah, it's not bulging out. There is no, the slope doesn't change. So you need something to keep these two atoms from falling into the density peak in the electron density. And that's what we need restraints for. Things we can restrain are, well, foremost interatomic distances and bond angles. Um, but also the flatness of aromatic uh, compounds. We can restrain torsion angles uh, in some cases. This is not always advisable. I'm going to talk about this in the end a little bit. The chiral volume, because we know that proteins and nucleic acid only have one type of chiral, chirality, we can restrain this. NCS, if you have more than one copy in the asymmetric unit and they form some kind of symmetric arrangement, you can restrain non-crystallographic symmetry, meaning you force the three copies to look very similar to each other because they are representing the same protein. 
anti-bumping restraints keep atoms from falling into each other using van der Waals. And um, you can also restrain the B factors, the displacement factors, because very clearly if two atoms are bound to each other, um, it's not that one can be terribly movable with a huge B factor and the other can be free. The two movements are correlated and you can restrain this to simulate this in your model. Constraints, well, everything listed above can be constrained. You can constrain atomic distances, flatness, um, NCS. You are also using constraints to simulate hydrogens. You may be very unaware because typically your model does not include hydrogens. Yeah, you don't usually see them, but they're there for anti-bumping restraints and they're usually put in ideal position. So their um, position of hydrogens is almost never refined in um, X-ray crystallography, in macromolecular X-ray crystallography. We always assume the hydrogens in ideal positions. Which of course um, means you make some assumptions in particular when it's about OH groups where you don't know where on the ring the hydrogen sits. Uh, other constraints are the occupancy, which is typically set to one. You can put in a lower one manually, but then that also has to be firmly adhered. And another implicit constraint is your space group symmetry. Once you've fixed your space group and you decided for one and you're refining in it, everything has to obey the space group symmetry. Um, special position atoms. So for example, if you have a sulfate on a um, two-fold axis, um, um, and that was a, just a very bad example. Um, if you have a sulfate on a um, three-fold axis, um, you are constraining um, the distances between the sulfur and the oxygen. Um, if you have a floating origin, you can, con you can and need to constrain this, but the program will do it automatically, so you don't usually see it. The atomic form factors about which I talked in the last lecture are also a constraint. You can't change them, or you can change them, but you cannot refine them. Um, you, for example, need to change your form factors when you go from an X-ray diffraction experiment to a neutron diffraction experiment, because the form factors of elements between X-rays and neutrons are very different because the X-rays interact with the atoms very differently. They interact with the electrons, while the neutrons, um, well, the cross-section is just different. And um, the scaling between F-ops and F-calc um, also needs to be uh, constrained. So while I said this is a parameter that can be refined, it can also be a constraint. And um, if parameters are highly correlated, which can happen, then there is an internal reparametrization where one of them is fixed and the other one is allowed to move. This happens particularly often when you have um, a freely refining occupancy as an exception from the rule. So where your occupancy basically has gone to refinable parameters. And you also have a B factor on that atom because the B factor can blow up and the occupancy um, basically can um, go up as well with it, or you can have a lower B factor with less electron density covered and a lower occupancy. So the two are correlated and reparametrization is necessary. Here's an example of isotropic refinement. I just quickly wanted to show you this. Um, in isotropic refinement, the B factors, large B factors here are colored red, uh, low B factors are colored blue. It's an isotropic refinement and therefore all the atomic B factors are round. There are no other shapes than spheres here. And the size of the sphere, the size of the B factor relates to its movability. What you can see is that the outskirts of the macromolecule are more movable, the B factors are higher than the inside, which is possibly exactly what you assume given that there is tight packing on the inside of the molecule, while on the outside the molecule is exposed to different disordered solvent in each unit cell and therefore can adapt slightly different conformations 
and you would in the old days before we had cryo measurements also see thermal vibrations here a lot we still see them they're still a contributing factor but at lower temperatures they're not so much um, an influence this is the same structure we find anisotropic um, you can now see that the spheres have mostly been replaced by ellipsoids. If they look round, it's only because the parameters are similar. What you can also see is that there is some disorder, but most of, so disorder is meaning that here you can see two copies um, of the same side chain. What you can also see is that in the outskirts, it looks like a bunch of Smarties. So this is, of course, physically not making any sense, in particular this region here is physically very um, ugly. You would not expect uh, the atoms all to move in different directions from each other when they're bonded to each other. So clearly, in this case, anisotropic refinement is introducing way too many parameters and the model just does anything to fit the data. Um, so no good. And a kind of in-between solution is TLS plus isotropic refinement which has been very exaggerated for this picture because usually they, it's very hard to visualize. And what you can see here is that the main motion that the TLS would basically move the entire thing anisotropically, but as a rigid body, in addition to isotropic B factors, is doing a libration movement like this. So you can really see that there is some kind of like libration uh, wobbly motion going on here. And that comes on top of an already existing individual B factor for each atom. Um, also important is to know there are shift limiting restraints which dampen the shifts of parameters in early refinement stages. In the early refinement stages, um, the parameters, the refinement can easily become unstable and crash. In order to uh, avoid this, the parameters are only released slowly, slowly as the whole thing is approaching a minimization. This is the reason why when you start a refinement, for example, in RefMec, the initial R values are always high and then quickly drop. This is because of the shift limiting restraints. There's also general weighting of restraints against the reflection data, which is really important. It means that your geometric restraints have to be weighted against the reflection data. Remember, both are taken in as a type of data. If you make the weighting too high, the molecule is too rigid and too ideal and doesn't fit the measurement data very well, your R value will be high and the model will possibly not represent what you've measured. If it's too low, you can too easily overfit the measured data with a physical, with a model that is not making physical or chemical sense. And that's called an overfitting. Um, indicators for good weighting factors are bond length and angle deviations, um, as well as the coefficient between R3 and R work. Some programs do automatic weighting. Actually, today, most programs do that. But if your R3, R work are deviating from each other very much or are very close together, or if you are having problems, for example, because your data quality was very bad, to get your model to be chemically good, actually like looking like a proper protein, you may want to consider um, lowering or heightening your weighting factor. It's, you can find it in the input somewhere in the box. Least squares, um, as I said initially, um, assumes all errors to be Gaussian and uh, assumes also that a perfect model would perfectly predict the observations you've made. So that um, there would be a kind of ideal state. And it is a really good method to refine small molecule structures and it's also used for very high resolution protein structures. But for everything else in the macromolecular world, we are using maximum likelihood methods. So maximum likelihood um, takes the error distributions into account. It basically asks which model has likely produced these data. Um, and the error distributions can be, take, can be something different than Gaussian. 
Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because uh, as users you will not uh, need very much beyond knowing these terms. But um, I've forgotten to put here a literature reference. I'm going to post this in a Telegram chat later. There's a very good article by Ali McCoy in Acta Crystallographica D called Liking Likelihood, in which she explains beautifully using dice the um, central concepts that we are using in structural biology for likelihood. And if you think you've come across these terms before, it has been measured in both previous lectures. So maximum likelihood is also used for phasing with molecular replacement, as well as in experimental phasing um, with the programs, for example, phaser and sharp. So likelihood is really very popular in macromolecular crystallography and for good reason, because it, it can deal with errors. Now, of course, the data resolution has an effect. And this is shown here in a picture by Rob Nichols. You can see a 0 0.5 angstrom structure. And as you can see at 0 0.5 angstrom, you have, you can see that each atom in the density is nicely separated, very round, it's beautiful, would be very easy to build into this structure. Um, and it's easy imaginable that here, each atomic position could possibly be left relatively alone and the model would still refine okay. At 1.4 angstrom, which is still considered a very good so-called atomic or near atomic resolution, the blobs have started to fuse into each other because everyone wants to call their structure atomic resolution over the years. Atomic resolution has come to mean, I can distinguish just about the rounded shape of the atom density. Mm, okay, so at 1.4 angstrom, you still can see everything very clearly. However, here you already need restraints because everything could fall into each other otherwise. At 2.5, which is still a very nice resolution to refine in, it becomes a little bit hard to know what side chain you're actually having. Some atoms are really lying at the edge of the density despite being in a correct solution. At 3.5, atoms start to be outside of your electron density. And if you go even lower, you start stop seeing side chains, you stop seeing things at the surface of your molecule. And it's really not nice. 3.5 angstrom is already very ugly to refine in. It used to be a little bit more ugly about 10 years ago and then cryo came along and they have a lot of like what we would call bad resolution data. And therefore our methods for refining lower resolutions have improved dramatically. That brings us basically to the last topic, practical questions, problems, and pitfalls. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about what your um, workflow should be. So you have your integrated scale data, possibly converted to amplitudes already, uh, typically in an MTZ file. Um, in macromolecular crystallography, could be also HKL or SCAR. You take this to automatic refinement, which is done with a program like BASTA or um, Phoenix Refine, which gives you an R value in statistics as well as a map and a model. Now, in the CCP4 world, in most other world, the map is again in an MTZ format, but don't be fooled, it's now containing phases and it's not the same data that you put in at the beginning. Be sure always, always to feed your automatic refinement with your measured data and never to take that map. Um, I had a master student who had to repeat half of his master thesis because he made that mistake. So consider always taking your measured data into the refinement and not the map that's getting put out of this, unfortunately, in the same file format. Um, you also get a model. Um, depending on what starting model you had, you may have to feed in a starting model here. Um, unless you used also an automatic model builder. Then you do manual model building in a program like typically food where you try to like put in the right side chain, mutate what needs to be mutated, add some waters, change your model um, as a chemist. Um, this is called manual model building and gives you well an improved model, hopefully. And that gets back into automatic refinement together with the data to give you another new map 
calculated from the phases from this new model. What is the workflow? And you repeat this a lot. Um, if you are a well-versed crystallographer, a typical refinement will take you about 10 of these cycles. However, my first refinement as a student took me about 60 with much going backwards as well. So typically refining a structure takes between two weeks and several months and is also as a general rule never finished. So if I look at models that I deposited last year, I still find stuff that I could improve. But at one point you have to make a cut and just live with the errors that certainly are going to be in there. So don't be fooled also. Everything that is in the PDB is bound to contain some errors because people did not fix every problem they had. Um, it doesn't mean that these structures are fundamentally wrong. Hopefully they aren't but you're always going to be able to improve on structures. It's because the fit between the measured data and the model is so bad that there's always some room for improvement. Typical workflow would be to start from, for example, experimental phasing or molecular placement with many cycles of refinement. And by this, I don't mean the ones that I've just shown, but the cycles that you give to automatic refinement so you would do 100 to 300 cycles of automatic refinement. And then you do 20 to 30 for each new model that you've done in manual model building. You first build as much as you can of the protein, starting with the backbone, then the side chains, always going to your automatic refinement in between. And hope the density will improve. You don't spend too much thought on the R value. So you want the R value to go down, but really a difference in R value between 0.1 and uh, so between 29.1 and 29.2 is irrelevant. The standard uncertainty of the R value is too high. It's only calculated if it's R3 with a limited number of reflections. Don't be bothered by small changes in R value. However, if your R value goes up by 5%, that means you've done something wrong. Um, your phases are worse. You possibly want to reconsider what you've just done. And it's also nice to keep a little off book on the site um, and to save each intermediate state so that you can later in your method section describe what you have done during refinement. Um, once you have most of your protein, you may want to consider using a TLS in addition to isotropic B factors. And then once you've done TLS, that's high time that you add waters you can add some waters even before that if you are perfectly sure about their positions very often if there are some backbone coordinated waters these are very early visible in the density then you optimize the weighting factor and then you do ligands last so you keep the area where you think a ligand may bind clear and you save before you add it because you will possibly want to do an omit map for your publication, which is a map in which the ligand hasn't been fitted in yet. And you just show the density to prove that your electron density gave you some hint of like this re ligand was really there. Because once you fit in the ligand, I'm going to show this in the next few slides, you're always going to get the density back. Um, it's no proof anymore that your ligand really was there. And then you should also validate using things like checking the difference peak, using the Ramachandran plot, and in late stages of the refinement, you also want to use something like more property, which will be the topic of our next lecture. Ligands. There are three things to be afraid of. Your own expectation bias, most of all. So imagine you've dedicated two years of your life to a PhD thesis to show that this ligand is actually binding to that structure as a substrate, for example or as an inhibitor to heal some illness. You would expect it to be there and you would try to fit it in by whatever means. So be aware of your own human feelings and your own expectation bias. Also be aware of model bias. Use OMID maps, meaning maps that have never been calculated from something that has never seen the ligand. And use those as a proof that there was density before you fit it in ligands. That's also why you leave ligands to last. Beware of bad restraints. You should check the chemistry and be totally aware of the chemistry and stereochemistry of your ligand. Um, my colleague Nick Pierce expressed it uh, like this. Not sure if ligand 
or just 10 waters. Why can we not just look at maps to find out if our ligand is really there? Well, remember that problem that we lose the phases? So our X-ray data are giving us amplitudes. But in order to calculate a map, we also need phases which come from the model. So the map is inherently, half of the map, half of the information that goes in the map comes from the model. And therefore the map is always biased to look like the model. So this is a very grave problem in X-ray crystallography and it's called model bias. Um, and again, if you fit in a ligand like this and you refine, there is more density ought to show up here because of the phases coming from this model containing the ligand. You also have expectation bias. So this is a very nice example from Bernhard Rupp. Um, this is what the authors fitted in, but it was TMS that it actually had this. And it fits the density, it's very clear that it fits the density much nicer, but because they expected this, this is what they put in and this is what they really had. So you need to be very open-minded about what could fit in here, have a play, check everything, double. Um, my general experience is that many bosses are even having more expectation bias than their students. So, um, you need to check yourself if you believe that that ligand is really in the density. Um, I had one case where a problem structure was sent to me and that structure contained a number of problems. But I was at that time rather inexperienced in building a nucleic acid and it was an RNA structure. And I built it just looking at the density and getting some advice on how to be build nucleic acid and LMB. And I built it and what I built was an RNA quadruplex. And at that point in time, there were not very many structures. So RNA quadruplexes were generally thought, so that's four strands of RNA associating with each other, were thought to be rare and would have not been considered by the scientists who had actually measured the structure, but because I was rather inexperienced, I built the structure correctly showing quadruplex. So be open-minded. And the last one is bad chemistry. So if you have bad restraints or no restraints, this is more a case of no restraints, coenzyme A can look like this. And if you are a chemist, or a chemist, you should look at this and kind of consider what's wrong with it and you should be able to see it. Unfortunately, I can't see your faces in an online lecture, but for example, these two atoms are basically occupying the very same space, this uh, carbon and oxygen, and that's clearly something that's not ought to happen. And um, I would also say that some of these bond angles are dotty. Now, I'm showing this saying that ligands can be bad in that way, and that really is the frequent case but you should also be aware that this can happen to your protein. So you can, for example, have problems like cis peptides in your structure and you need to find them and cure them because the restraints are allowing things to be cis because it occasionally happens. There are different programs for macromolecular refinement. This list may not be complete. There is um, Buster and TNT, which is using maximum likelihood in this used a lot in industry, can do incredibly much. Um, CNS and Phoenix Refine, uh, basically um, CNS was the one that was there before and Phoenix Refine came afterwards. Um, it uses macro cycles, so it doesn't refine all of the parameters at once, but one after the other. And um, it also has to be said that these programs give you slightly different R values, which does not necessarily mean that the models are better or worse, but it can also mean that they are calculating them slightly differently. Um, ResMec, which is the CCP4 program and can do, for example, automatic twin refinement. Um, ShellXL, which, I would, which is a least squares program, and I would really only recommend it if you are having very high resolution data, but then it can model beautiful complicated disorder for example and very complex uh, structures 
um, explore, which is ra rather antiquated choice these days and very new is um, Tristan Kroll's program, Isolde, which is using um, force fields um, instead of restraints and um, where you can see your whole um, molecule move while you are model building. So I would highly recommend to try that out just because it's fun, um, but also because it gives you know, structures and also be used for cryium. Low resolution refinement is a special case, and I really hope that as your first structure, you're not gonna have this problem. Um, it means that only few data have been measured. This is a main problem in macromolecular refinement because you are having very many parameters, but you may have only low resolution. So you need to put in more constraints and more restraints in order to get less parameters and more data. So you can implement things like hydrogen bond restraints, which say if a hydrogen bond donor and hydrogen bond acceptor are coming close to each other, they should have well an ideal distance uh, and not move away too far from each other or get too close to each other. You can have similarity restraints to similar structures um, and jelly body refinement and a number of other things are also helping you there, like morphing. Um, so I'm in the end, I'm going to give you a few examples uh, for these low resolution refinement. The first one are hydrogen bond restraints in ProSmart. The example is again from Rob Nichols, who has been my colleague at MRC LMB and has developed this method. And here the hydrogen bonds are restrained to be to the ideal instances, which can stabilize secondary structure features. So you have this um, helical structure here. I hope you can kind of like see, um, this is what's called a Christmas tree-like structure because the side chains are always looking like a Christmas tree and then the distance here is 3.4. And if he then uses these restraints, um, the whole thing moves a little bit as you can see, um, to get to 2.8 ideal distance, and that basically improves the density fit a little bit. Another thing is if you have two structures, so in this case, um, there was a structure of ovotransferin at 3.5 angstroms, and external restraints were applied from a homolog at 2.1 angstroms, the initial R value of the structure was 28%. The R3 was 33%. As you can see at these high values, the R3, our work gap is relatively high, um, which is normal. Um, once you do ProSmart external restraints, the R value drops by um, about 2%. This is what happens. So first this stuff here possibly because you to model bias has density after the restraints are applied, the density vanishes, this density becomes better. So it's a pretty dramatic improvement. You absolutely would want to know about this um, if it's your structure. However, there are two things that manually should be corrected. So this side chain needs to go into the green density and this thing also needs to be a little different. So you manually correct them, right? You flip the peptide on the bottom and you put the side chain um, correct in the correct place uh, using real space refinement in CUD, so manual um, intervention. And then you do jelly body in RefMac and that further drops the R value to very nice 30% R3, which is clearly um, an improvement of a 33% R3 before. Um, so I think this is a very nice example of what we can do today with um, low resolution and advanced restraints however, is considered a rather advanced topic. Other advanced topics are um, twin refinement or if you have pathologic data, so anisotropic data, for example, you want to use something like star aniso, um, you may want to change your weighting factor. If you are having a twinned crystal, you must consider doing a twin refinement, which is a special type of refinement where you're assuming that there were, that each reflection consists of two intensities. NCS model building, where you have similar copies of the same protein in your asymmetric unit. You want to, if you ever, if ever occurs to you, you want to look into building glycosylation and nucleic acid. This ha happens relatively frequently. There are special restraint sets for both of them and special tools to help you. 
if you have lichens and you need help with their geometry and restraints, there are like builders and helpers like Prodrug and Acedrug. You want to possibly look into map sharpening and blurring in particular if you think there are some details that you just can't about see. And uh, sometimes you may want to reset your R3, for example, because you're starting from an earlier structure and now have new data, in which case you need to shake all your uh, parameters uh, from the first refinement to make the R3 as independent as possible. However, this lecture is short. I'm not going to cover these topics here, but they may give you some additional readings. And if you have any questions about them, um, please write me an email or write me in the Telegram group. Um, yeah. Um, in refinement, a structural model which represents our hypothesis is fitted to the measured data. So I think that a structural model in particular details should always be displayed together with the electron density, even though it's not a standard, because the model is really only your hypothesis. It's not um, the result of your experiment. So many people talk about this, like a model has resolution, um, a model is the out. The, the model is only the outcome of the experiment, but it is a model, as the name says, a structural model. The data to parameter ratio guides your refinement and with it, the resolution typically. Whatever parameters you choose depends on your resolution. Um, those parameters, restraints and constraints should be chosen carefully. You should also think about what you build first and what you build later and how you're approaching uh, the workflow and you should make a lot of notes while you do it. The refinement of models, except for those where you're only exchanging a ligand from the model you had before, the refinement of new models cannot be completely automatized. A brain is required and it's really required. So check your chemistry. If something less looks to you physically unreasonable, check up your chemistry textbook to make sure that it's really ought to be that way and also use external validation like for example mold property pdb redo and um, what check i'm going to talk about these in the next lecture so that your structures can be validated and also keep in mind refinement never ends i know it can be in particular if you're using shutter free d glasses it can be a lot of fun everyone loves doing it it's like playing a computer game with real scientific results and um, well, it's almost as tempting as after phasing, seeing a structure that no human has seen before for the first time on your computer display. But it never ends. At one point, you'll have to submit your thesis and stop. That's it from me today. Um, next week, I'm on holiday, so there will be no lecture. I'm going to be back on the 31st of August. That's in two weeks for. Um, the 10th lecture in the series about the validation of structures and I'm hoping to see you all back then and um, I'm very happy to take your questions. Um, please feel free to write them in the chat. Um, please also feel free to activate your camera so I can see you um, if you ask a question or not. Um, Ferdinand Kirsten is asking so for proteins with flexible parts or side chains that can come in different conformations, is it better to just choose one of the possibilities and refine fully in that direction or to be happy with higher values but leave all conformations possible? If your electron density is giving you an indication of where the side chain is lying, this is where you should model it. You should possibly also check against the Rotomer library see whether this is a common confirmation for this side chain. Um, the only situation in which you should leave all confirmations possible by either deleting or setting the occupancy of the side chain to zero is when you can't see any density. I hope this answers the question. Then um, we're going to close for today. Please don't forget that there is no lecture next week. Our next lecture will be in two weeks on the 31st of August, and I hope to see you back then. Bye.